This is the start of a mini series, which I'm not exactly sure how long I want this to run, um, but it's going to be an introduction to sheaves. And uh, before you click away or anything, I, I know that, you know, if you've tried reading about these before, maybe you come across some really abstract things, right? It starts with the definition of a pre-sheaf as a contravariant functor, or maybe you've gone to NLAB and seen something about growth and deke topologies and whatnot. But I want to start really, really basic, hands-on examples of sheaves. And in fact, you might be surprised to learn that in a certain sense, if you've taken uh, Calculus 1, basic sequence in calculus, you've already sort of studied sheaves a little bit. Uh, well, let me explain what I mean by that. So what do we study in calculus, right? The, the sort of basic object of study are continuous functions from the real numbers to the real numbers, right? And we integrate them and we take their derivatives. Um, so, well, it's not just functions uh, from the real numbers to the real numbers though, right? We also sometimes consider um, a, a, a function, you know, if we're integrating a function between two points A and B, we don't even really think about it as, as necessarily being a function on the entirety of the real numbers. Rather, we think of it as, you know, simply a function from this uh, open interval, a, b, right? So we also study functions from open intervals. Now, sometimes it is phrased as being a function on a closed uh, uh, interval, but that's a small technical detail that doesn't ultimately matter here. Uh, for reasons about when we generalize this to arbitrary topological spaces, we're going to think about this uh, in terms of open sets. And so, okay, so we're actually studying different families of functions, right? We, we look at continuous functions on the entirety of the real numbers. We look at continuous functions on uh, open intervals. And you might think, well, what's the, the difference between those things? Um, you know, because normally we think about those functions as, as coming from uh, what we would say globally defined functions, right? Functions on the entire thing. So, you know, for instance, you might be taking the integral from, from minus pi to seven of, of sine x dx. And so in this instance, we can think of sine x as just being a function from the open interval minus pi to seven. However, we know that sine uh, x is a function defined on all of R, right? So, so one property I want to highlight right away is that we sort of have this notion of uh, restriction, right? That is, we have continuous functions that are defined on the entirety of the real numbers, and those induce a function defined on the smaller interval, right? If it's defined everywhere, it's defined on the smaller patch. Um, and moreover, there's, there's a sort of compatibility of this restriction. So what do I mean by that? Um, if instead, you know, say I was trying to integrate from minus pi over two to one, Right. Well, this function, how do I get this sine function down here? I could either restrict my sine function that's defined on the entirety of the real numbers first down to this interval minus pi to seven. And then maybe I, you could think about it as I'm breaking up the integral further. And then I could restrict down to um, this interval. Right. But the point is, um, is that there's a sort of compatibility is that I could have just restricted right down to that interval in the first place, right? So, so in other words, if I, if I have some function, which is continuous, a continuous function defined on the entirety of the real numbers, restricting it down to uh, minus pi over two to one had the same effect as taking f and first restricting it uh, to minus pi to seven, and then restricting that function uh, down to minus pi over two to one. And this might seem silly, right? You're like, yeah, the, this is obvious, um, but it's important for sheaves, right? That's almost why, you know, a lot of times you hear people saying like category theory or sheaves, things like this are, what makes them hard is it's actually really simple. 
you know, these these properties that we're highlighting in the definition seem so basic, so fundamental. And yet that's why he, the notion of a sheath is powerful because it captures so many of these interesting notions. Okay, so we have families of continuous functions on the real numbers, continuous functions on uh, open intervals, and there's some sort of notion of restricting them and some sort of compatibility with that notion. And the other thing to notice too is that not every function is the restriction of some function from the entire space. For example, you know, we 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 look at functions like one over x, right? This is not, uh, never mind continuous, this is not simply not a function on the entirety of the real numbers because it's not defined at zero, right? And so we can look at functions that are defined on sort of smaller spaces. And now that's sort of interesting, right? Because as our open sets, our open intervals shrink, the functions that become available to us, we, we get more and more of them, right? Because those, those sort of points that we're ignoring, like those could go in the denominators of certain functions. Um, and already that starts to give us a little hint as to the geometry that's captured by the function on our spaces. So for example, if, if we were sort of thinking of the, the ultimate space that we're starting with as not being the real numbers, uh, but being the real numbers less the, the, the origin, right? Well, then that actually tells us something about our, our, the geometry of this space, right? The fact that we have this hole there, this disconnected piece is somehow encoded in the fact that we have more functions available to us than if we had the entire space. So that's a little hint at some of the ways in which the, a sheaf looking at the functions on a space captures some of the geometry. Already we're presented with some interesting questions, right? Like, um, you know, given, given some function, uh, does it come from a globally defined function? Right, that's already uh, an interesting piece of information. And what's the other major thing that we study uh, in calculus? Of course, we look at the derivative, right? So if we think about some function, you know, just some some arbitrary function, and uh, you know, let's let's think about our definition, our formal definition of the derivative, right? It starts off something like for all epsilon greater than zero there exists a delta uh, greater than zero such that x minus a less than delta implies that blah, 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 blah. And the idea is, is that we're thinking, you know, when we're, we're, so this is part of the definition of a limit that's baked into the definition of a derivative. And we think about the derivative, we're thinking about approximating that function at that point, right? We're looking at the behavior in smaller and smaller open intervals. So writing this on my graph here, you know, maybe this is my point A, when we think about approximating the function, um, we can think about this as, as, you know, choosing smaller and smaller deltas here, making our X closer and closer to A. And so what does this look like? This looks like taking uh, a sequence of intervals that get closer and closer uh, to this point and looking at the behavior of the function with respect to those. So this is actually, um, I should mention, this is starting to hit on the, the notion, which we won't see for a couple of videos, of the stock of a sheaf, right? So we're gonna wanna keep this in mind um, that the stock has something to do with our notion of derivatives or linear approximations of a function near a point. So for now, in the name of you know slowly moving towards the definition of a sheaf, just based off of our notions of what we already study in calculus, um, I'm going to start laying out some of the definitions of what it would mean to be a free sheaf on the real numbers, right? So a little bit more generally, because we want to think about moving to topology more generally. So instead of just open intervals. Um, I'm going to think about open sets, right? So, so a pre-sheaf on the real numbers is going to consist of the following data, 
right? And well, data is an imprecise word, right? So here's another little hint at what's to come. This is why we formulate things in terms of like a functor between categories, right? Because it actually gives it some sort of more concrete meaning. We can, you know, build it within a certain formalism of mathematics. But um, a, a presheaf on the real numbers, which uh, I, I'm, I'm going to denote the presheaf uh, script F, uh, this is going to give us for every open set in the real numbers, it's going to be the assignment of a set. So on the side here, we'll keep our example uh, inspired by continuous functions, right? I'll, I'll, I'll write C for this pre-sheaf that we're uh, getting of continuous functions. What would that be? We would assign to each open uh, set of the real numbers the set of continuous functions from that open set into R. And so here you see the assignment of a set. Now, if you've tried looking up the definition of a sheaf before, you've probably also seen that sometimes we let it be an abelian group or a ring. Um, there's a good reason for this. Um, abelian groups are really nice, right? If you've looked at things like the category theory that goes into an abelian group, it's a really nice category, right? And so if we want our sheaves to have a nice, be a nice category, um, sometimes we let it be valued in that. And so for example, you know, for now we can just think about sets, but this does have the structure of a ring, right? Uh, what, what would be the sum of two functions? Well, it's enough to say what that function does at the point. Of course, we just take the pointwise sum of those two functions, right? And you know that sort of tells you why we would take the entirety of the real numbers to make sure that we you know stay within these confines. Uh, same thing with multiplication of functions, right? Um, and then of course it's you know a matter of some analysis one to show that that preserves continuity of the function. And so what else are we going to have? Well, we noticed. So if I scroll back up for a moment, uh, remember we noticed that there's this sort of idea of restriction. Right. There was this was some sort of important thing and which functions came from a restriction, which ones didn't. So um, for us, we also want there to be some sort of rule where if we have um, a smaller open set in a larger one. So this doesn't just apply to restricting from the whole space. Um, there should be some map. Um, res, you know, U down to V, which goes from the the sheaf over the larger open set to the sheaf over the smaller open set, right? And again, this is just if we think about the context of our pre-sheaf of, of continuous functions, this literally is just restricting the function to the smaller set. So often we'll use the notation, uh, you know, if I have some uh, little f in here, might not necessarily be a function in the traditional sense, but uh, we might write for the uh, restriction map when it's understood where uh, we're restricting from and to uh, F uh, bar V, normal restriction notation. And the other thing we noticed is that uh, restriction should compose, right? So uh, that is to say, if I had some W in between here, then restricting from U all the way down to W immediately, uh, we concluded, again, this is just coming from our intuition about functions and calculus, that should be the same thing as if we just restricted first from U down to V, and then we restricted from V down to U, right? There should be some sort of uh, compatibility of these restrictions. Um, and the final thing is um, we just want, and, and again, this sort of hints at the fact that there's something functorial going on behind the scenes. Any open set contains itself, right? And so that means that we also have the restriction from U to U, and well, that shouldn't really do anything, right? Because we're not really changing the, the open set. So we're also going to demand that this should just be the um, identity for that part of the sheaf. And so this together 
um, gives us the data of a pre-sheaf on the real numbers. And in fact, um, really the only thing essential of, there's nothing special about the real numbers here at all, right? I could have just called this a topological space X and all the words I said, open set, restriction, these all work the same way. So um, in the next video, we're going to, so this is the definition of a pre-sheaf. In the next video, we'll talk about the definition of a sheaf. And again, we'll look at the real numbers and functions we looked at at calculus to see an example of the difference between these things.